This is the Listening Books Podcast. For every kind of reader, and especially for fans of audiobooks. I'm Jessica Stone, and today I'm offering you this conversation with Dr. Julie Smith, clinical psychologist and author of the Sunday Times bestselling title, Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before? Julie, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Um, I have found your book immensely helpful already. Um, and I thought maybe we could just start off with, um, you know, when when did you realize that there was a need for this book? Uh, well, thanks for having me. It's really, um, I'm really excited to chat to you. Um, I think the need for the book happened sort of over time, really. So I had, I had left the NHS. I worked in the NHS for about 10 years. Um, and once I had two of my three children, uh, I realized I couldn't do it all, not well anyway. And, um, so I decided to run a very small private practice just myself so that I could sort of manage that around the family. And, um, and while I was doing that work, uh, I realized that a lot of the people coming through to see me, uh, found the educational aspect of therapy so incredibly helpful and, um, you know, lot, and that's, you know, the, the title of the book is, is, um, sort of honoring those, those people who said things like, why has nobody told me this before? How mm. did I not learn this in school? It's not rocket science. It's really simple. But when I put it into practice in my daily life and I take it seriously, it makes this huge difference and life's getting easier. Um, not because life is throwing less horrible things at me, but because I feel more equipped to manage it and fight back. And, um, and so I think that need for, um, the, you know, the, the, the wish in me to want to share it more widely was already there. So um, I would sort of come into my husband at the end of the day and say, you know, this stuff should be more available. This is really useful stuff, but people have to pay to come and see me to find it out. And, you know, they don't necessarily need long-term therapy. So, you know, um, I, yeah, I was sort of putting the world to right saying it should be more available. And my husband said, well, go on then make it available, you know, put it on YouTube or something. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we started to do just that. We started to make videos at the same time, the short form video, um, craze was happening and, um, it was just a fantastic way to reach so many people. And so we started to make some sort of bite size um, videos with just one element of information at a time. Um, and very quickly, as it, you know, within within a couple of weeks, it just started to go and and every video was getting more and more views. And there were lovely comments and messages from people saying, I found this really useful. What's the next part or what's the how-to or can I have some more information on the thing? So, um, you know, we just kept making videos. But over time, you know, we realized that all of these videos are, you know, they get seen, but we can't control when they get seen or in what order or, you know, those kind of things. There was no coherence to it all. So, um, and, you know, social media will only show certain things to big numbers of people, you know, if they're getting lots of attention and things. Um, but you can have a video that's not necessarily entertaining, but is really, really useful that it doesn't get shown. So I wanted to kind of write the book so that all those people who were showing that interest could have one place where they could go and get their questions answered. You know, that when, uh, when life throws these very human problems at us, um, you know, you, you could have somewhere to dip in and say, what would a therapist say about this? You know, what, what kind of advice might they be giving um, without having to necessarily, you know, it's, it's not to replace therapy because it's only the educational aspect of therapy. Um, but I wanted people to be able to get hold of that without having to, you know, pay to come see someone like me. I'm putting myself out of a job, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, but also I think you make a great point in the book about how these tools that you offer aren't just for use when you feel like there's a problem. And most people don't seek therapy until they feel like there is a problem that needs to be addressed. But that much like looking after the rest of your health, a lot of these tools are there to, to support your mental health, um, even, even when there isn't a specific challenge that you're, that you're facing in the moment. Um, which I, I think makes it yeah. really useful for for everybody. Yeah, and and I really wanted it to be that. I don't mention, I don't think I mention at all in the book, um, 
any disorders or, you know, psychiatric conditions. It's all about the very human problems that we all face at some point in life, you know, um, be it bereavement or uh, troubles in our relationships or periods of low mood um, where we'd want to feel different or periods of high stress or anxiety for various reasons. And, you know, we all go through ups and downs. That's part of being human. But there is this arsenal of tools that can really help with that that people don't seem to be uh, sort of forthcoming with. Mm. And um, so th they really are, although they're t skills that are taught in therapy, they're not therapy skills, they're life skills. Mm. I use them. Um, I'm hoping that my children, you know, I'm hoping to sort of teach my children those things as, as they go. Um, but they're also the things that, um, you know, my clients found really helpful. Yeah. Um, you narrated the audiobook yourself. Um, I'm curious how you found that experience and if there was any discussion about that choice yeah. beforehand. Um, do you know, I felt quite strongly about that because um, I'm a big audiobook lover and mm. um, ever since, you know, I, I'm, I've always been a big reader, but once I had children, um, you know, busy mum life meant that, you know, sitting down with a book um, has a huge degree of guilt attached to it. Um, but I realized I could put my, you know, put my headphones on while I'm doing, you know, boring household chores and also consume a book at the same time. And that just feels brilliant for me. And, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm a big audio book consumer and I, I feel quite strongly, you know, there are books that I've sort of felt quite disappointed about because I desperately wanted to hear the author's voice and then couldn't. And, and I think when you write something, um, you have a an idea of how you're how it's sounding, or how you want it to sound. And and I tend to write as I would speak to people, um, and so I wanted it to yeah I wanted to be able to get it across in that way. Um, but I actually it's a funny story. I the week before I was due to um, record, I actually lost my voice a few days before. I lost my voice completely. Oh no! Um, and we had to push the recording back, and so. Uh, we only pushed it up back by a week because we obviously had to get this thing out. So, um, yeah, I, w I was surrounded in, you know, honey and lemon and and throat sweets and just trying to preserve my voice all the way through. But um, thankfully, we we got through it. It was all right. Well, the result is very easy to listen to, you and I and I can appreciate how because you were the one reading it that it sounds the way that sh that. Sh with the tone that you meant it to sound, yeah. you know, um, which is really valuable, especially with when dealing with when dealing with delicate sort of topics where the kind of the the gentleness of your encouragement is really a huge part of 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 what's offered in the book. Yeah, I think um it's it's just so special when you hear something from the person who had the message in their mind saying it in the way that they wanted to say it. Um, and, and I always feel this sort of buzz of excitement when I, you know, um, realize an audiobook is, is going to be read by the person who wrote it. I, um, I really enjoy that. Mm. You're also good at it though. I don't think that every author necessarily should read their, their own book because it, because it is a skill. Um, and it's great when, when that skill is aligned, um, with the author be able, being able to read in their own voice, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that every author does. So it, it was, it was really yes. nice that that you were able to bring that to the book. That's true. I guess some some authors necessarily, you know, don't um, uh, don't like that or have that skill. And and yeah, a good a good reader who can bring a book to life, um, yeah, is just as valuable. You're right. Listening to audiobooks can be relaxing, riveting, and sometimes educating. But what it always is for me is a space to forget about my everyday thoughts and worries and truly revel in being told a story. I'm patron of the wonderful audiobook charity Listening Books. They stock thousands of best-selling audiobooks that you can listen to at the touch of a button. If you have an illness, disability, learning difficulty, or mental health condition and live in the UK, you can join today from as little as £20. And they offer free memberships for those who would find the £20 a barrier to joining. So, what are you waiting for? Relax with an audiobook today. 
Join now at www.listening-books.org.uk forward slash pod. I also really appreciated the thoughtfulness behind the way the book is laid out. Um, so you can read it front to back the way that I did, but it's also divided so that if there's just a particular challenge you're facing, you can just go straight to that chapter yeah. and get very like digestible uh, sized um, ad advice. Um, it's not like a wall of information or text. And you've got these little, I don't know whether to call them sidebars. Um, the, there's a little, in, in the audiobook, there's a little sort of ding sound that lets you know that there is a tool for your mental health toolkit that's that's about to come. Um, and I think in the in the text, there's a little wrench. So you do see some of the tools show up fairly often um, in in the toolkit. And I wondered if you might want to share the most or one of the most versatile tools that we can use in our mental health. Sure. Um, yeah. So, so the book is, I, I sort of, I really wanted to lay out the book in a way that you could dip in and dip out because I think sometimes you have, you have a problem and you want to know right now what somebody would say to help. You know, you want to have that sort of guidance in your mind about how to deal with it. So I wanted it to be laid out in that very, very way so that people didn't feel they have to sort of wade through pages and pages of irrelevant things to get to the stuff that they wanted. Um, yeah, so it is split into the sort of the different um, problem areas, if you like, so that you can go straight to that area and just read that part. Um, but you can also read it as it goes. Um, and there are sort of small tools. Often I'll put things like um, journal prompts and and questions that I might ask as a therapist um, because, and that's because in answer to your sort of main question that, um, one of the, probably the most important and first tools that anybody needs is one of, of self-reflection that builds self-awareness. Mm. So it, without fully being aware of and understanding a problem, you know, forget trying to solve it. Um, I think it was, um, I think it was Einstein, wasn't it, that said something like, I'm going to ruin this quote now, that if he had an hour to solve a problem, he would take 55 minutes to understand it and then five minutes to solve it. And it's kind of a bit like that, that once you understand a problem well enough and you're so acutely aware of it, um, it becomes much clearer and much easier to take the steps that you need to take to you know, break that cycle or fix the problem in some way. So um, self-awareness is something that is is always taught in therapy, that ability to reflect on experiences first in hindsight. So that's what you do in therapy. You know, you go along and you talk about, you know, the week before or, you know, the month before things that have been happening. And you look at those with a bit of a microscope and, and step back from it and kind of see in its entirety, not only the the things that I did or said, but what were the cycles I was in? What what are those things I'm going round and round on again and again? And so you get this kind of bird's eye view on your life and you're doing that in hindsight. But when you do it in hindsight enough times, because it's the same old cycles that we're all going around, in the end, you start to get to the point where you notice those cycles in the moment as you're living it. And you think, oh yeah, we've talked about this. I know what I'm doing now. And I know I now have this choice to go with the cycle that keeps me feeling stuck or to do that other thing that I know will break out. And, and those moments are, you know, pivotal for change because if we're not self-aware, we just let those moments go. Right. And we find ourselves going round and round and round mm. in these cycles that we don't want to be stuck in um, and feeling kind of helpless with it all. But as soon as you've got that awareness, sometimes you will go around those old cycles, but sometimes you won't. Sometimes you'll do something different and you'll reap the benefits of that. Um, and then you'll start to see that as a possibility for, for the future as well. So, um, it, you know, all of these changes are gradual, gradual, um, and it's really about the self-awareness stuff. So I would say in terms of, um, you know, using tools to build your self-awareness around any problems that you face or things that you want to tackle in your life, um, you can do that through talking to other people 
you know, be it a therapist or a friend who is really non-judgmental and very helpful to you. Um, but it can also be done through journaling. So if you're not a talker or you don't have someone particularly to talk to, you can write things down. Um, and that's where the, you know, the different questions in different chapters um, provide those sort of prompts to get you started. Because there's a difference between, you know, constructive self-reflection and rumination. Mm. The rumination is that kind of I think of it as a sort of thoughts washing machine where you're you're just thinking of the same thing and it's going round and round and round, not really helping you. But when you're being self-reflective, um, there are certain sort of questions that lead you somewhere um, that help you to get to a point of thinking about um, what can help here and what's holding me back. Mm. You know, what part am I playing in maybe keeping myself stark that I could change and what things can't I change because they're out of my control? Mm. And, you know, where do I want to go with this? And all, all of those sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, I think journaling is a great and really easy way to start building that superpower of, of self-reflection. Yeah. And I, one of the big takeaways for me in alignment with that was to to ask those questions with an attitude of, of curiosity and compassion rather than um rather than of criticism. Yeah. Like, why can't I get this right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it's a huge um uh process that happens in therapy every every single day, every single session. I'll I'll often be um, you know, we'll we'll notice um a certain tone or a certain direction that the conversation is taking. And then it will often be my job to say, let's notice, let's notice that so the critical nature of that and let's turn back towards curiosity. How how interesting is this? Mm -hmm. Even if it's something you can criticize your, yourself about, shifting to interesting. What's that about? What do I make of this when I'm trying to understand it? So it's, yeah, seeking to understand rather than judge. Um, even if you find yourself naturally judging because that's what we all do and we've learned to do that from, you know, um, the early days of our lives. Um, but we can still notice that that's happened and then pull ourselves back mm. and turn towards curiosity. So what if I was going to look at this like a scientist, as if I was seeing it for the first time and I was trying to understand it. And that can really help us kind of shift away from uh, the sort of self-loathing approach that that is not constructive at all. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I learned that kind of surprised me was that uh, motivation is not a tool. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, and and I think I think I got sort of frustrated seeing all of these things online, um, these sort of gurus and things that would say, you know, you're either born with it or you're not. You know, there are motivated people and non-motivated people, and um, you know, winners and losers and that kind of thing. And it's just not true. You know, motivation is a feeling, it's a sensation that you get, and interestingly, it's often the sensation you get, you know, as you're leaving the gym, as opposed to going into the gym or, you know, mm. the feeling you get or the feeling I get after I've written a chapter, not just before. Um, it's, it's that buzz you get from action and realizing that action creates that wonderful sort of fiery, excited feeling of drive and motivation, um, enables us to recognize that, okay, we, we can't wait for that feeling to arrive before we do the thing that's really important to us mm. because it doesn't come. Uh, we generate it through action. So um, recognize, you know, treating motivation as, a, as an emotion just like any other means that there's sort of two avenues to approaching it. Um, there are certain things you can do to invite that feeling to be there more of the time, right? So um, that's when I start to sound like your mother, you know, when yeah. I start to say things like looking after yourself, you know, and it, but it's just true. If you, if you have a good night's sleep, you're much more alive and motivated the next day than if you've had poor night's sleep. Or if you're exercising, you know, if I, if I go on a little jog down the lane here where I, where I live, I don't go far and I don't, you know, go beyond what I can do. I just, you know, potter along but no doubt, every single time I come back in a better mood, feeling a sense of drive for the rest of my day, uh, it just happens. And, you know, feeling hydrated, being well fed and um, good nutrition and having contact with friends, social, social world is so important. All of those things help to invite that feeling to be there more of the time. You know, there, there's a reason that those sorts of things are used as weapons of war against 
you know, um, uh, prisoners of war because they break people. If you take them all away, we lose our drive. We lose our, you know, sense of motivation for things that we're passionate about. So I think, yeah, having a lifestyle where those things are um, non-negotiable helps, but also then recognizing, okay, it is a feeling. So no matter how hard I try, it won't be there all of the time. Therefore, I can't, um, I can't rely on it. Um, and when there are things that are important to me, how do I then get over that hump of not feeling like it on the days that it needs to happen? Um, and that's when I talk to people about um, getting really clear on our own values and what's really important to you um, and staying very close to that. You know, I do a, I, I put the values check-ins in the book, which is a sort of a check-in with your life really to see, okay, what are the things that most matter to me right now? And am I living in line with those? And if not, what small things can I do to shift in that direction? And I, I just, I think it's just so um, anchoring and centering when you do that. Um, because then you know, if you're, even when life is tough, you're living in line with what matters most to you. So for example, I've got three small children. It's not that unusual for one to be up in, or two to be up in the night. And, you know, if you get woken up at two, three o'clock in the morning, every cell in your body is saying, don't move, go back to sleep. And, um, you know, that's, that's complete sort of lack of motivation, but I still get up to, to see my children and make sure they're okay, because it's just so clear in my mind that that's the parent I want to be. That's my set of values around parenting mm. is that I want to be responsive and caring and present and all of those things. So I'm able to do things that feel difficult in the moment because I'm so clear on what's important to me. Mm. Um, and you can apply that to any other situation, you know, sort of getting up for work or going off to the gym because you value, you know, looking after your health or fitness or whatever that is. Um, uh, so yeah, really, really important that I think being clear on why you're making the goals that you're making and making sure that they are your own goals, and nobody else's, and that they truly matter to you, um, helps you to then um, have something to tether yourself to when the feeling of motivation is not there because, you know, the feeling of motivation can disappear just because you had a bad night's sleep or because you're particularly dehydrated when you wake up in the morning, you know, mm. it could be anything. And so those things then help us to get over those uh, hump days, as people often say. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought up the section on um, values, uh, the values check-ins, um, because possibly for me, one of the, the most helpful sections of the book um, was on this idea of of really exploring who you are and who you want to be and how focusing on that and living in alignment with that is is way more important than pursuing happiness. And so I kind of I well, I wondered if because I mean your your book has lots of wonderful prompts to explore this. Um I wonder, is there one that you can give to listeners, maybe for a journaling activity, something that might get them started thinking about this? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the the, the values exercises are really simple and easy and quite quick. You know, sometimes I'll sit down with pen and paper and I'll just draw out a sort of grid of squares on the paper and split it into the different areas of my life. So that might be parenting, career, lifelong learning, health, uh, family relationships, my marriage, friendships, all these sorts of things. And um, uh, so you can, yeah, split it up into the different areas of your life. And then the really, the key, I think, is to think about not just what do I want to happen to me in these areas of my life. So not what you want other people to do or how, you know, to make you feel, but it's who do I want to be? So how do I want to show up in this area of my life? So I don't know, let's take parenting. Um, what kind of parent do I want to be? And how do I want to show up for them? What do I want to represent to them? Um, so it's really about, you know, no matter what happens in good times or bad, how am I showing up? What am I going to represent? What am I going to stand for? And what attitude do I want to bring to that situation? Um, if I'm going to feel at my best or if I'm going to feel um, proud of myself and proud of how I how I approached it. 
And from there, you know, you don't have to write reams and reams of stuff. Often, I think just a few words will come to you. Um, you know, I think for me in that sort of parenting box are things like uh, love and patience and uh, care and a presence, those kind of things. So uh, an enthusiasm. And so sometimes I will just have those words sort of lingering in my head because I remember writing them down. And so then when I'm in a moment um, and it's difficult to be one of those things, um, I can recall it, not all the time, right? Because we're human, but I can always bring myself back to it. And then when I come back to these exercises, I think the idea is, you know, it's really helpful to um, sort of grade them. So once you've got a picture in your mind and those words of, you know, what's really important to you, you can just simply grade it out of 10. How important is this to me in my life? And let's say it's 10 out of 10. Like it's so important to me to be that kind of parent. And then I'm going to grade it again, also out of 10. But this time, how how much do I feel I'm living in line with those values right now, like this week or this month? Hmm. And, and so if I grade something at 10 out of 10 important to me, um, but when I look at how much I'm living in line with it, it's say a two out of 10, then that's a, an indicator for me to look at that area of my life in more detail and say, okay, what is what are the barriers? What's holding me back from being the person I want to be in that situation? And how can I overcome some of those? Or, you know, maybe it's a different area of my life pulling me away. So often, you know, with most parents, there's that that struggle between being needed at work and being needed by children and and wanting to be in both places as much as you can and and not being able to. And and so I'll often use those values exercises to look at, um, you know, am I being pulled in one direction too far and do I need to pull back? And um, so I find it really, really helpful to to do it in that way. And it's a really simple exercise. It's, it's It comes from um, acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT for short, um, that has lots of sort of different ways that you can look at your values. Um, but I, I find that one really, um, really valuable and easy to do. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, another one of the surprises for me um, in the book was was about self esteem, um, which was was kind of all the rage for a while, especially perhaps in the context of parenting. Um, I wonder if you could say a little about um, why building self esteem is not necessarily a, a helpful focus for us, and what we should be focusing on instead. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I was sort of part of that generation. Really, when I was doing my undergraduate degree in psychology, there was lots of talk about self esteem, um, particularly in kids, and you know, going into schools and um, getting you to sort of list off things you like about yourself and that kind of thing. And um, and I was all for it. And and I think over the years, as the sort of research has sort of piled on, um, I, I realized that while it is important to develop a good sense of self and a generally have a good view of yourself, I think the path, the, the path you use to get there is crucial. So if you genuinely don't believe positive things about yourself um, and, and someone asks you to, you know, repeat into the mirror, I love you, or, you know, you are strong, or you are, if you don't genuinely believe those things, what that does is it sort of sets up a little argument in your own mind, because those little voices come in and say, well, hang on a minute, that not, that's not true, because, mm. and so you then find yourself trying to almost convince yourself of something you don't believe. But I think what's more important, you know, I think, so when your self-esteem is low and you you, know, you don't maybe have a great opinion of yourself, sometimes it's because maybe you're not living in line with your values, for example, or you're not doing something that you know is important to you and would make you feel the way that you want to feel. But at those times, I think what, what the sort of self-esteem idea misses is how crucial self-compassion is. Mm. So I won't sit with someone in therapy and try to convince them or get them to convince themselves that they are worthy and brilliant. Um, I will be uh, honing their skills of being kind to themselves no matter what. Because sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't live up to your expectations for yourself, right? Mm. And, you know, if I, going back to that values exercise or along the sort of parenting front, 
if I wasn't being the parent I wanted to be, but I sort of blindly still felt that I was, you know, perfectly brilliant and okay, um, then I'm missing something. And I'm I'm missing something cr- that's crucial in being able to improve. Yeah. So, um, you know, in order to turn that around, what I really need is to be compassionate with myself, to recognize I'm human. This is really difficult, a huge, huge task. Um, and and I've got my own back. Mm. You know, when when good times are all bad, I am going to do the best by myself, even when it's the more difficult thing to do. And I think then when you when you have self-compassion and you behave with self-compassion, you treat yourself well, I think self-esteem grows anyway because you start to do things that make yourself proud mm. and you start to live in line with the things that are most important to you. So yeah, I think rather than sort of exclusively focusing on your opinion of yourself, I think your opinion of yourself changes when you live in a way that makes you proud and that you approve of. Mm. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's better to kind of start with self-compassion and action. That's gold. Thank you. <laughs> I wonder, um, because, you know, using that example of, of self-esteem, which was all the rage for a while to focus on that, um, and I think is still really prevalent in in a lot of par- what people assume is best when it comes to parenting or or addressing their own mental health um and i it just made me wonder if there's something that's all the rage right now that you think maybe the evidence just isn't there to support and we'd be better off looking elsewhere um i think probably linked with that stuff is the affirmations so You'll often get things online that tell you to, you know, repeat after me, I am lovable, I am whatever it is, you know, these sort of affirmations where you're essentially trying to convince yourself to believe something. And those things work if you already believe that thing and, you know, if you already believe you're worthy and you're saying to yourself that you are in the mirror or anywhere else, um, then you might get a little bit of a buzz from that. You might You might feel you know, a bit uplifted for a while, but the effect is generally short-lived. But if you don't believe that, then you have this internal argument that we talked about where, you know, um, all the thought, your your mind will just come up with all the reasons that you're not that thing because that's genuinely what you believe. And so, you know, beliefs are really difficult to change by just repeating that over and over again. You have to change that belief through action. So I think we have to get really, really honest with ourselves instead and ask ourselves, you know, if I believe that, then what's going to change that view? How would I need to be living? If I was to truly believe in whatever the affirmation is, you know, I'm strong or lovable, how would I need to be living? What what would I be doing differently um, in order to, you know, believe that? That doesn't mean to say affirmations per se are not helpful. They, They use to great effect in things like sports, but in sports, they're very different. So they're not trying to convince you of anything that you don't necessarily believe they are quite instructional, actually. So it's very much about process. You know, when I step out on the court and the crowd goes wild, then I step forward, then my wrist comes up and I hit the ball, you know, whatever that is. So it's very process orientated. Hmm. So, and what that helps people to do is focus on the process that they've practiced a thousand times over while they're under pressure Hmm. and, and trusting that when I go through this process, then positive outcomes happen. So, you know, they're not trying, you know, sit, you know, they're not standing in the mirror in the changing rooms trying to convince themselves that they've already won, you know, the Super Bowl or Wimbledon or whatever it is. Right. Um, and then trying to have a little argument in their mind about whether that's true or not. It's just a set of instructions to follow almost that are super helpful to working under pressure. So that's when they can be fantastic. Mm. Um, because of I guess the age that we are living in and how much we am, are bombarded with information and inevitably misinformation. And I mean, you brought up the affirmations thing. There's a, I know there's a TikTok trend at the moment that's really into manifesting and the, I don't know if you've heard of the lucky girl syndrome, but it's basically the same thing. Just, you know, manifesting the the good things you want in life by speaking them into existence. Um, I was wondering if you have any tips for for sifting the the helpful from the not so helpful. Are there any red flags to to watch out for? 
Um, I think without having, you know, without having the sort of um, red flags to see, um, especially online, things can be wrapped up in ways that look very real. Question everything, you know, whoever's saying it, um, whether it's professionals or non-professionals, take it as one possible perspective, everything. Um, Because sometimes professionals get it wrong too, right? Research advances and then we all go, oh, right, the world's not flat. Let's change (laughs) the books. And so, you know, science learn continues to learn. And, um, And in that sense, you know, everything that you get from anyone, take it as one possible perspective, but question everything. And and if something feels like it could be important to you in your life and you're going to take it seriously, um, get, make a point to get several different perspectives on it um, so that when you are, you know, if it's something to do with your health, for example, then it's really, really important to get different opinions and and then weigh up the options and, and the, the evidence. Is there anything that you wish you could have included in the book that didn't make it in there? Oh, great question. Um, I think in some ways um, it's a really difficult one to answer because um, I think once once I start to unravel that, that will be things that I want to write about in the future. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I um, yeah. Uh, people people have said to me before, you know, I will you write another book? And I, and I said I, I don't want to write books for the sake of it. There was a real genuine passionate purpose behind this book and and I felt like I was holding on to this gold mine and and it should be shared and um when someone asked me that I, I said if if you do see another book with my name on it it'll be because I think there's something really really important I need to share mm. and to shout about um uh, so uh, yeah I I couldn't really clarify exactly what that is yet but I think I'm at a stage now of um going back to the books and researching and learning. And and that's what I really love to do. And that's what I loved about the book was being able to go back and um, dig into the journals and, Mm. um, you know, get all the research. And, you know, I'm I'm a psychologist at heart, so I I read this stuff for fun, weirdly. Um, And so, yeah, I think as I'm continuing to learn, you know, I don't know everything. And um, as I continue to learn um, about people and the, the human mind and how that can help us, um, then I will want to, you know, shout about it from the rooftop. So yeah, um, yeah, watch the space. <laughs> <laughs> Where can listeners find more of your content? Uh, yeah, so I'm on Instagram and YouTube and um, all the different platforms that um, that people access. Kind of short form videos. So on those, I share yeah, sort of short form videos. If I'm ever doing any kind of live talks or anything like that, those tend to be posted on my Instagram stories. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, generally I'm sort of on all those different platforms and um, in most bookstores now too. <laughs> Excellent. Is there anything else you'd like to highlight today? Anything you would love to be asked? I mean, it's just been an absolute pleasure to to have a chat with you and um, I love talking books. It's great. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, it's been a real pleasure for me as well. And like I said, um, I have found the book Um, immensely helpful personally. Um, I feel like I've got some homework to do. Like there are some exercises I really want to take the time out to do. Um, And and so I just, I thank you for the the practical, the the practical advice and the the encouragement to sort of take a step back and, and examine the life that you want to live. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. For more practical, compassionate tools for living while human, check out Julie's book, Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before, in all the usual places, including in our own collection at Listening Books. The Listening Books podcast is produced by Listening Books, a UK charity that provides an audiobook lending service for over 115,000 members who find that an illness, disability, learning difficulty, or mental health condition affects their ability to read the printed word or hold a book. It's simple to join. For more information, head to our website, www.listening-books.org.uk. 